Good morning. I'm Julie Wallman, president of Widener University, and it's a pleasure to be with you this morning to kick off Widener University's Common Ground Project with this panel discussion entitled The First Amendment, Finding Common Ground in a Polarized World. There's no more important role for higher education than guiding students to define and meet the challenges of the future. By doing so, we help them prepare for personal success and we prepare them to be active participants in a thriving democracy. The faster the pace of local and global change and the more interconnected our world, the more diversity of views we will encounter and the greater the need to find common ground in order to advance the good of all. At Widener, we encourage and create opportunities to talk about differences in open and respectful ways. And hopefully you had an opportunity to experience that at one of the tables as you came in. We deliberately engage our students in challenging but civil conversations, and we help them learn from diverse perspectives. Like our Widener students, we can all commit to finding common ground as we continue to discuss, debate, and grapple with tough issues and difficult conversations. Widener University is proud to be leading the way as a university that values, teaches, and exemplifies the pursuit of common ground. I want to thank my colleagues who worked so hard to plan this event, especially Katie Hershady, Mary Allen, Bridget Hilferty, Wes LaCrone, Gordon Henderson, and Jim Vike, and also, of course, the dean of our Delaware Law School, Rod Smola, who is joining the panel. We're very proud to partner today with Mr. Jeffrey Rosen and the National Constitution Center a beautiful and perfect venue for our first discussion in the Common Ground Initiative. Mr. Rosen is president and CEO of the National Constitution Center. He's also a professor of law at the George Washington University Law School, a contributing editor of The Atlantic, and a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Mr. Rosen is a recognized national expert in constitutional law, the Constitution in the 21st Century, Technology and the Constitution, and the Supreme Court. Thank you to Mr. Rosen and his excellent staff here at the National Constitution Center, and to all of you for being with us here this morning for what I know will be an engaging and lively discussion. And now, we're ready to get started. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, President Woolman, and welcome everyone to the National Constitution Center. We are so excited here at the center to collaborate with Widener University with your exciting Common Ground initiative, because bringing people together of different perspectives is the essence of what the National Constitution Center was created to achieve. The Constitution Center is a very special place. It was created by the US Congress during the bicentennial of the Constitution to be the only place in America that disseminates information about the Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. And that inspiring mission leads us to bring together people of different perspectives, liberals and conservatives and everyone in between, to converge around this beautiful document of human freedom that unites us, the US Constitution. I'm especially excited, uh, Julie, if I may, about our conversation this morning because your Common Ground initiative is the essence of what Madison and the other framers of the Constitution believed was the essence of American democracy. So Madison and Hamilton and the authors of the Federalist Papers saw a tension between direct democracy and a representative republic. They believed that Twitter mobs and Brexit votes and the 18th century equivalent of quick majoritarian passions would lead to demagogues and the mob. And that's why they created a constitutional system to slow down deliberation, to bring together different perspectives, to require enlightened representatives of the people to rise above faction and to converge around the common good. We're seeing today, ladies and gentlemen, a tension between that model of thoughtful deliberation 
and populism in America and around the globe, and from social media technologies that are speeding up deliberation and isolating us into echo chambers and filter bubbles, citizens online and in the public square are talking to people who agree with each other and are refusing to deliberate and are refusing to reach common ground. So this initiative you're engaged in is not just a civic or academic enterprise. It's central to the future of American democracy. That's why it's so important that you have a visionary president who has determined to make your university a model for the kind of engaged civil discourse that the future of democracy requires. And that is why I'm going to begin, uh, Julie, President Wallman, by asking you why you decided to create this Common Ground Initiative and give us examples of the kind of conversations that you feel are most successful in promoting civil dialogue. Great, thank you so much. Um, we hear a lot about the extremes on campuses, about the small number of students who disrupt speakers. We hear about young people today being fragile snowflakes who can't hear anything that, isn't, that they're not comfortable with and that they're not engaged, too many young people aren't engaged. I don't think that's true. That is not what I see on Widener's campus. Widener University students are civically engaged at a very high level in many, many ways. In fact, our students voted at a rate, our main campus students, undergraduate and graduate students, voted at a rate 14% higher than the national average for other campuses in the last election, and our law students voted at a rate 25% higher than other law schools nationally. So we are an engaged campus, and we know that our students bring different perspectives. We're not a campus where everyone has the same beliefs. And because of that, it creates a lot of room for debate and reasoned argument. We also have a principle called we're all widener. We are all widener. We have worked very hard to promote the notion that it is our responsibility personally as individuals and as a university to create a context and to be people who are willing to listen to other perspectives, who are open and respectful in that listening, who are looking to build mutual understanding and unity rather than um, discord. We have different perspectives on our campus, but we are not a polarized campus. We are a campus that is working to listen and learn and grow together for the future of our country. We also have a faculty that is deeply dedicated to having difficult conversations in the classroom. Many campuses have faculty who, who don't want to deal with difficult conversations, who want to turn away from the fact that their students bring different perspectives to the classroom and would rather not get into those difficult issues. That's not the way it is at Widener. Our faculty are open and willing to try to engage in those challenging conversations. And we have faculty leaders here in the room today who are doing a lot of work on intergroup dialogue and helping with professional development for faculty to help them learn how to better facilitate those conversations. And we have faculty in this room, I named some of them earlier, who have been working with students to help them learn how to facilitate difficult conversation. So we think we are creating a model for other universities in how to help our future, our young people, our college students today, become people who know how to find common ground and to move our country forward. For that reason, we thought this is an initiative we really need to do. To do. We really need to take the lead in this area because we have something special to show others. That is exciting to hear about the results of those conversations, and it confirms Jefferson and Madison's idea that an uh, ignorant citizenry cannot uh, be fully participatory, and when people are educated and hear different perspectives, they're more likely to be engaged. Can you give us specific examples? I know the group has just been having these conversations. What sort of thing are they talking about, and what emerges after people of different perspectives have discussions? So. One of the things that we did before this and, and we will be doing after is students will be asking individuals about their perspectives on some what we might consider hot button issues, um, issues where people will have very different perspectives. And their questioning is very open ended. So they're asking, you know, 
you know, why do you think that way? Might you, in, in some instances, think another way? So out at the tables in front, you put your flower pot in a certain place to show whether you felt you were more liberal or more conservative in your views. But then the students said, are there times when you're more in this direction? Or are there issues on which you believe more, you're more liberal or more conservative than you think you are in general? So even understanding that we ourselves, it's not, a, it, these issues aren't simple. And we're not liberal or conservative. We have a variety of perspectives. What we need to do is talk about them, think about them, reflect on them, and inform ourselves. The most important thing is informed debate. And so one of the things our students asked was, where do you get your news? How do you get informed? So if you, if you didn't have an answer to that, hopefully you'll walk away from this saying, I need to be better informed. I can't, you know, I need to be building my perspectives based on good information. One more, that's fascinating. One more question, and I want to turn to Rod. Uh, at the Constitution Center, we vote before and after our constitutional debates. And last week in Chicago, we debated the question that I'm about, about to ask uh, Rod, does the First Amendment protect hate speech? Before the debate, 76% uh, uh, said yes, it does protect it, and about 12% said no. After the debate, 76% said yes, and 12% said no. No one changed their mind. But 83% said their mind was open to the arguments on the other side. So my question is, what kind, kind of shifts or changes or results do you see as a result of these discussions and debates? Well, it's a great question. And we know from some of the national surveys that many people believe that, uh, especially many college students believe that um, the First Amendment does not protect hate speech. And we know that that is, that is not the, the case. Um, it, it, it does protect all speech. Um, but except the speech that leads to violence, and we'll probably talk about that later. So I think what is happening with these conversations is we're recognizing that maybe what we think of as offensive speech is not intended to be offensive, and that it's a, another person's perspective built on where they're coming from. And so I think our students, through these conversations, are learning more about free speech, and so that they would understand that there, what the First Amendment tells us, and that the most important thing in our democracy is that we are open to all speech and informed and able to debate that. I think we see a greater openness among our students because of this project and an awareness of what the First Amendment actually says. Wonderful. Well, at Widener, you are fortunate to have uh, one of America's absolute leading experts on the First Amendment in Dean Smala. Uh, when I was in law school, uh, Rod's book about the First Amendment, Free Speech in an Open Society, was my First Amendment Bible. And I want you all to read it, because it's really the best introduction to the American free speech tradition uh, that's been written. And now he's the head of your distinguished law school. And as, as President Wallman says, Many American students are not aware about the First Amendment tradition. A recent Brookings survey found that only 39% of undergraduates right. think the First Amendment protects hate speech, 45% right. think it does not. And yet the Supreme Court has held repeatedly that it does. So Rod, if you will, this is a, uh, we have a unique opportunity to learn from you. Tell us about how the Supreme Court came to believe that the First Amendment protects hate speech, and then tell us about the countervailing tradition on the court in the dissenting opinions that is being invoked today to try to change the meaning of the First Amendment. Thanks, Jeff, for that gracious introduction. I'm, you framed the issue at the beginning as um, these great tensions that the framers had of these big ideas that were debated right here. I like to fantasize sometimes what would someone like James Madison think or say to us if we had a couch right here <laughs> and Madison came back and we asked for, for his reflections. Now, I suppose the first thing he says, you know, Rosen, can you get me Hamilton tickets? But, <laughs> <laughs> I can't. Yeah, yeah no, I know. It's very hard to do. <laughs> and, and then he'd say, Hamilton gets a musical? <laughs> Aaron Burr's a star? <laughs> Nobody's done a play about me? All right. There's still hope. We can There's write still one. still hope. Yeah. Federalist 10 would be a really great rap. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and then imagine James Madison seeing that show and seeing the debates of the framers sung by African Americans. I mean, it would be a, sh a culture shock, but it would be a testimony to the resiliency of those big ideas and how they've evolved over time. So let's talk about 
another tension, the tension over American free speech thinking. So what I'm going to do, try to do it very quickly, is suggest that you can take the entire history of American debate over the meaning of free speech and see it as a battle between two powerful, beautiful, attractive ideas. And so, so much of our Constitution is the, the resolution of these competing intentions, both of which have a, a hold on our heart and our minds. We're attracted to two opposites very often. And that's very true of free speech law. And so I'm going to suggest that you can think about free speech law as a 100-year debate. It really began, I know we're here at the Constitution Center, we like to think about 1789 and 1791, but really in earnest it began in the United States about 100 years ago, around World War I. So it's 1917, 1918, 1919 that the debate was joined. Now here we are 100 years later and the same issues are, are deeply, deeply contested in our society. So here are the two theories. I'm going to give them nicknames. The first theory is what I'll call the order and morality theory. And it held ascendancy for about the first 50 years of that 100-year period. And I'm going to talk very quickly about two cases that represent that theory. The first is the case that's often thought of as the, the birthplace of it, a simple case from 1942 called Chaplinsky versus New Hampshire. Involved a man named Walter, Walter Chaplinsky, a Jehovah's Witness. He's preaching in upstate New York in Rochester. And he's causing a ruckus. Uh, he is railing against organized religion. People don't like what, he, what they're hearing. He's attacking Catholics, and, and it's making people uneasy. And the local police officer basically tries to do the right thing, says, you know, would you chill? Can, can you just move on down the road? You're, you're creating a little bit of an agitation here. And he won't. He won't stop talking. And finally, the police officer says, I'm going to have to arrest you. And this causes Mr. Chaplinsky to lose it. And so when you talk about free speech, you've got to use naughty words. So I'm going to tell them. He says to the police officer, you're a goddamn racketeer. And the whole town are fascists. For this, he's arrested. His case goes to the Supreme Court of the United States. He says, I had a First Amendment right to make those statements. The Supreme Court said, no, the First Amendment does not protect that speech. It was a form of hate speech. Seemingly mild to us today, yes. but for that, for that period, <laughs> bad. <laughs> and so there's one paragraph in that opinion by Justice Frank Murphy that's an absolute masterpiece. It captures the beauty and soul of the order and morality theory. He says, there are certain types of expression, the prohibition of which have never been thought to cause any constitutional problem. And think about the extremity of that. No problem banning this, these forms of speech. He then lists them. And, and lawyers like Jeff and I will debate the list, and is the list still good? I'm not too interested in the list for you uh, right now. He talks about the profane and the libelous, fighting words, you've heard that phrase, words which by their very utterance inflict injury or tend to incite a breach of peace. I'll come back to that in a second. And then in one masterpiece sentence, he captures this side of American thought. Why don't we protect this speech? He says, because these utterances are no essential part of the exposition of ideas, and whatever slight value they have in the pursuit of truth is outweighed by the societal interests in order and morality. So before I move off of Chaplinsky, let's unpack that sentence, because it's filled with, with beauty. First, what's he say free speech is about? It's the exposition of ideas. It's the kind of things scholars like Jeff Rosen do. It's the kind of things you do. We do as students. We do as teachers. It's, it's about the intellectual side of life. And then he suggests that speech can hurt, speech can harm us in two fascinating ways. We tend to think, well, it's OK to ban speech if it's going to cause violence. It's going to cause someone to punch someone in the nose or engage in a shooting. But notice, that's not the theory of Chaplinsky. He says, words which by their very utterance inflict injury. The word itself can cause pain, can cause injury. And that makes perfect sense to us. How often have you put your hands over a child's ears? You can't hear that. Muted something because you don't want to be exposed to it. And we all think of words that just to hear the word, just to see the image, just to be exposed to it, damages the soul in some way. 
Trigger warnings in universities are examples of this. Beware, you're about to hear something, the very hearing of it might inflict injury. And Chaplinsky says that that's, that's part of morality. Society has a right to say we're a decent society, we're a moral society, you shouldn't attack people on religion, you shouldn't attack people on the basis of race. And so Chaplinsky embraces that, and then it also says in the keeping of order, the, the, the prevention of violence is a societal interest. Now, what happened to Chaplinsky? Well, it took off like a rocket. It became the dominant theory. And the case that encapsulates it, which is so important in our current American experience, it's so reminiscent of the events in Charlottesville, but events all the time that we debate, is a case from my hometown, Chicago, 1952, right at the halfway point of the 100-year period, basically called Boherne versus Illinois. I'm just going to take a quick second to describe it. It involved a racial supremacist group, very much like the groups that were marching in Charlottesville, like the KKK or nationalist supremacist groups. This one was called the White Circle League. The White Circle League leader, Boherne, was passing out leaflets in the south side of Chicago, an African-American neighborhood, um, viciously attacking African-Americans as sort of subhuman. He's arrested because Illinois has a law making it a crime to attack people based on their identity. It's a hate speech law. It's a crime to attack people on the basis of their religion, on the basis of their race. Boherne takes his case to the Supreme Court of the United States. He says, you can't throw me in jail for my racist leaflets. I have a right of free speech. The Supreme Court says, no, you don't. And in an opinion by Justice Felix Frankfurter, he says, Illinois can ban this speech. He cites Chaplinsky and the Chaplinsky theory, but he openly, Frank Furter, the only Jewish member of the court at that time, openly alludes to the Third Reich and the hate speech hysteria that led to the mass genocide of the Holocaust. And he says, and Illinois doesn't have to look to Europe. Illinois doesn't have to look outside its borders. It can look to its own torn history of racial division and racial riots and can say this kind of speech tears at the fabric of society, injures human dignity, erodes our sense of the rule of law, and leads to racial violence. And so Illinois can say, no, you can't do that. And so you see the power and the beauty of the order and morality theory. But from the very beginning, there was a counter theory, and I'll quickly describe that. It doesn't have a good nickname but I'm gonna call it the Holmes-Brandeis theory because we have one of the country's leading writers on Justice Brandeis. A beautiful book has just come out about the prophetic qualities of Louis Brandeis. You could also maybe call it the marketplace theory if you want. And I won't go into the facts of any cases, I'll just give you the, give you the theory very quickly. It couldn't be more different than Chaplinsky. It begins with a famous case involving Oliver Wendell Holmes, Abrams versus the United States, in which he is dissenting from a decision by the court to put in jail an anti-war activist. And Holmes in this theory, in this case says, in his famous opinion says, we have to tolerate even the speech that we loathe and believe fraught with death unless an immediate check is needed to save the country. Now that is a radical proposition. <laughs> it can be fraught with death we can loathe it, but you have to let it go unless you have to immediately move, not just for any purpose, to save the country, he says. I mean, it's an extreme statement of the idea that the marketplace of ideas is the way we should deal with speech and let good ideas battle with bad ideas and the government should not be involved. And then later, Justice Brandeis would add greater intellectual power to the Holmes theory, give it greater intellectual justification. And in Justice Brandeis's famous opinion in Whitney versus California, he talked about why it is we should accept the speech we hate. And he, he had two very powerful themes. One was fear. He talked about, and remember, it wouldn't be long before Franklin Roosevelt would say, you have nothing to fear but fear itself, would speak to the American people about fear. But he said, so often when we ban speech, it's because we're terrified of it, we're afraid of it. And one, the famous line, men feared witches and burnt women. And so he talks about the danger, very much like the, the fear of populism, mm -hmm. the danger that the mob would move against speech irrationally. 
And then his last insight, very hard for, for us to accept, extremely hard on an American campus to accept. It's the counterintuitive idea that you help the bad guys when you squelch their speech. That when you ban the Klan, you strengthen the Klan. When you ban the, 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 the Chicago Nazis, you strengthen the Nazis. That's hard to believe. But it's almost like in the South, they have kudzu. You, know, you can't get rid of the weed. You, cut, you hack it away, and it gets stronger. And the more you suppress evil speech, he said, the more you give it a romance, the more you it feed it. The more, it's, it's like the war on terrorism. You know, if you don't capture the hearts and minds of people that want to blow up you know, the West, it seems to feed terrorism. And it's not clear that force is the answer. And so that counter theory comes in and begins to battle the order and morality theory. And then as a baby boomer might say, you know, you read my book in law school. <laughs> as a baby boomer like me, generation older would say, everything changed in the 60s. 1960s, 1970s, a fascinating flip occurs. And Justices on the Supreme Court go back and they resurrect the Holmes-Brandeis theory and they make it the dominant theory. Now I'm going to end with this. It's not the case that the marketplace theory, the Holmes-Brandeis theory, has won the day and put the kibosh on the other theory. <laughs> In fact, they both exist today. They coexist. And here's the interesting division. In our open marketplace, out on the streets of Philadelphia, on the internet, in our public open spaces, our law has adopted the marketplace theory. We allow the Klan to march. We allow racists to be on the internet. We don't ban their membership. We don't ban their speech. But we have other segments of society in which we say, Check your First Amendment marketplace theory at the door. We're going to have order and morality here. The workplace, learning spaces, typically, courtrooms. You and I are under compulsions as lawyers to act ethically. We can't talk like Chaplinsky in a courtroom. And so that order and morality theory, that's, the, that's, that, that's sort of the aspiration we have. That's our better angel. That's how we would like to talk to each other. That's what we believe happens in a rational place. Last thought. Which of the two theories is the theory that defines the idea of the modern university? And I think if you look at debates on the GW campus or at Yale or at Widener or any American university for 30, 40, 50 years, it's, you see these two theories sort of at war. On the one hand, we think of the university as the ultimate marketplace. It's where we debate, where we talk, where we fuss, where we argue. On the other hand, we think of it as a community of scholars, as a place of respect, as a place of rationality, as a place that pursues common ground. Um, a. Bartlett Giamatti, the former commissioner of baseball, and then before that, he had a night job as uh, president of Yale. He, de he described. <laughs> He described the university as, um, as a place of ordered liberty, as a, as a free and ordered space. And he captured the two sides of that. I'll stop there. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you have just been privileged to hear one of the most concise and meaningful descriptions <laughs> of our two First Amendment traditions that I have heard. Please join me in a round of applause <laughs> for Dean Scott. That was wonderful. And I would like to uh, take the video and clip it and send it to schools across the country because that's a perfect encapsulation, vivid and clear and true, of these competing ideas. I now have lots of follow-ups, but here's the most basic one. As you've described it, the US Supreme Court, ever since the 1960s, has unequivocally embraced the marketplace theory. And yet, as you say, on campus and so forth, there's a support for the morality theory. Therefore, are not public universities violating the First Amendment as the Supreme Court has interpreted when, for example, they try to punish hate speech? Yeah, so the, I, I think it's an unclear um, situation. There are four Supreme Court cases that have rejected the marketplace theory for the lower grades. And so the cases that come out of high schools and middle schools have said that uh, 
high schools and, and high school teachers and high school principals can demand civility and decorum and respect the Chaplinsky theory governs. And so the question is, when you graduate from high school and go to college, <laughs> does it all change? And I think the right answer, Jeff, is it changes some. There are spaces on the campus that are the marketplace. But I don't think it's completely changed. I think inside the classroom, maybe inside dorm rooms, maybe within an athletic team, I think there are plenty of spaces in which the university has a right to demand, and the students have a right to demand of each other, um, civility and respect and so on. Now, the idea I've just suggested is controversial. Courts have tended, in the, in the cases involving speech issues at public universities, have somewhat tended toward the marketplace theory. But the Supreme Court of the United States has never really grabbed this issue in the, in, in, in the context of higher education. And I'm not entirely sure what it would say if it had the issue. I, I think you'd have to look at the specific context. Um, but so is, that a, is that a good enough response? I'm just going to press because yeah, it's ahead. such an important question, and the position you're articulating is so important. So at our Chicago debate last week, uh, it, it, we had an amazing group, including Jeff Stone, who right. is the a leading scholar of the First Amendment, who wrote the Chicago Principles. Sh the University of Chicago, more than almost any other private university, has embraced what uh, Dean Smala called the marketplace theory and said speech can only be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. That's the standard, and that's what Chicago has essentially embraced. And Jeff Stone, I asked him the question I'm going to ask you now, was the University of Oklahoma violating the First Amendment when it expelled student athletes who were caught on video on a school bus making appalling and racist comments yeah. about African Americans? Yeah, students? so um, it's a great question. That's Jeff's view. He's a White Sox fan. If you go north to the, <laughs> the Northwestern where the Cubs fans are, they, they, they embrace the Chaplinsky theory. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great question. I don't think that Oklahoma was violating the rights of those athletes. It's, co it's a complicated First Amendment question. You have a constitutional right to free speech. You have no right to be a Division I athlete. That's right. <laughs> Just as a government employee may be forced to engage in some concessions on their free speech rights as a, the price of being a government employee, just as a professor doesn't have unlimited free speech rights at a public or private university. You can be disciplined for sexual harassment. You can be disciplined for unprofessional speech, speech outside the, the scope of, 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 of any sort of fair understanding of what is um, appropriate for your discipline. If you're a Holocaust denier, I think, um, and, and a historian, you can be denied tenure, <laughs> in, in my view. I think, I think a university can say, we expect of our athletes not uninhibited, wide open, free speech, whatever you want to say. We expect you to behave in certain ways that show respect, and we can punish you for not doing it. Now, I, I, one, one last, I suggested these two worlds, and of course, the contest is often the boundary line. And in in employment law, and to some degree in student speech law, courts often struggle with this question. Was the speech connected to the job? Was the speech connected to the educational enterprise? There, the right to control it is at its highest. Or were you off duty? Were you outside of that realm? And so let's imagine a Widener student engages in a vicious, racist diatribe on the campus. That presents a different question than if they do it at a rally where they're marching as a free agent. Uh, same might be true of a professor. So where were the Oklahoma students at the time? You know, they're on a bus heading to an event. They're, they're in uniform. A court might very well say, I think they were more on the side of um, representing the university at that point. The university has a right to demand more. I'm guessing Jeff disagrees with what I, with what I said. Um, but, but, and he and I are very close on our views, but it's a tough, 
tough, nuanced question. L ladies and gentlemen, you see how important it is for you to listen to the arguments on both sides. You're hearing one of America's leading First Amendment scholars making a strong, nuanced case that that Oklahoma speech can be suppressed. And I told you about his colleague and friend, another distinguished scholar on the other side. Uh, Justice Holmes said, the Constitution is made for people of fundamentally differing points of view. And that's why learning about these two competing traditions is so important. Digging in, reading these cases yourself, and then making up your own mind is crucial. And as you do this, this is my injunction to you from the National Constitution Center, I want you to separate your policy and political views from your constitutional views. In other words, you might think that Oklahoma hate speech is terrible and appalling and hurtful, but the Constitution protects it. Or you might think it's not that big a deal, but the Constitution allows universities to forbid it. And by separating your constitutional views from your political views, you can elevate yourself as citizens and really engage in the kind of civil dialogue that this initiative exists to protect. OK, President Wallman, tell us about free speech on the, on the Widener campus. What policies do you have in place? And how do you deal with the inevitable controversies and conflicts that all university presidents are dealing with in these anxious times? It's a great question, and certainly um, very prevalent in the news today, uh, the, the issues that are happening on campus. So um, although we are a private university, we um, believe that we need to um, be guided by the law of our land, by the Constitution, and, and by the First Amendment. And so in general, um, we err on the side of speech at whether or not it is seen as offensive or uncomfortable for individuals. So one of the things we're trying to do with the Common Ground Initiative is to help people listen to views that they might find offensive or uncomfortable. But as Rod said, there are different spaces on our campus. And so in the classroom, we have a particular focus that we are trying to uh, achieve. And in that kind of learning space, it would not be appropriate for a student to take over the, the uh, class with you know, sharing their views that were unrelated to the topic of the class, just as it wouldn't be appropriate for a professor to do that. On, I, I would say that uh, when, you're, when you're representing the university on an athletic team, I agree with Rod completely. You, don't, you do not have a right to be an athlete representing the university. That's a privilege. And so there are expectations. But in general, we want to focus on the openness to listening to different perspectives. And of course, we're talking about the extremes right now. But most of the polarization that we're experiencing in our society and on our campuses isn't quite at those extremes. It's not that horribly offensive. It's not that clear. It's very nuanced. As, as um, both gentlemen have said, there, it depends on the context. It, there are nuances to each of these things. There are no clear guidelines. From my perspective, we need to be very clear up front about what our expectations are. So for example, one of the big issues right now is our athletes and even cheerleaders on some campuses taking a knee during the national anthem. Is that offensive? Is that protected by free speech? My belief is it's protected by free speech, and I think it's really important for our students to be able to express their perspectives in a way that isn't harmful, that isn't, um, uh, doesn't create disorder. Um, but how do we let people know ahead of time? So from my perspective, it's about letting people know what the guidelines are and what the expectations are before you are in an issue where on a campus people are questioning, is this right? Was this OK? Should we punish this? And a particularly punishing speech where students don't know that it's, uh, you know, we've drawn the line. So where there are clear policies and guidelines, I think we need to be able to share those and to make people aware. The other thing I think we're really working to do on campuses is to help people be sensitive to the impact of their speech. Your speech 
may not be banned in any way, but it may be very offensive to other people. It may play on power differentials. It may play on marginalization of certain groups. We want our students to be aware of that. We want them to understand when you share your perspective, be sensitive to how that impacts another person. It doesn't mean you can't share it, but it shapes the way you share it and your openness to debate and conversation about it. In the end, we want our students to engage in those challenging conversations. We don't want to set limits that aren't necessary. We do need to keep our students safe, so violence obviously becomes a problem, lack of public order becomes a problem, but we want to have as much openness as possible to have these kinds of conversations, but in a way that is respectful. Thank you for all that and for that very thoughtful approach. Um, Rod, as Julie just said, violence is one of the most controversial questions involving free speech. 20% of undergraduates polled in the recent Brookings poll thought that violence or shouting speakers down was an appropriate response on popular speakers. And the question of disinvitations from Berkeley to other campuses across the land has posed really tough questions for university administrators about how to deal with these problems in practice. So, does the First Amendment allow speakers to be shouted down or met with violence? And what should a president like Julie a woman do uh, when uh, there's efforts to disinvite uh, speakers which can lead to uh, violence or the threat of it? So here I can, keep, I can be very short. Absolutely not. You have no right to shout somebody down. Right. If you're in a public park and there's one people rallying on one side of the park and other people rallying on the other, they can yell at each other. But in an auditorium, you either be quiet or you leave because you have a whoever has running the show has a right to expect decorum and, and, people, and people should listen. Um, and second answer, universities should not disinvite speakers mm -hmm. <laughs> because that's just a larger form of what's called the heckler's veto. The, 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 the people that don't like the speaker um, uh, are able to squelch the speech that they don't like because of the disinvitation. So I think it's dangerous business for universities to do that. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a tremendous headache because, of course, the offensive speaker, sometimes they're invited by a group on the campus. Sometimes they invite themselves. But they're there to provoke the response. They almost want to be censored. Um, and uh, it's, 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 it's a mistake for universities to do it. And if it's a state university, it's a potential violation of the First Amendment for them to do it, in my view. But it, as you say, it's very tough in practice. So Erwin Chemerinsky, another of America's leading First Amendment scholars, is now the dean of uh, Berkeley. Berkeley. And he said, sometimes a controversial speaker comes in, the threat of violence is so great, if you don't disinvite them, the school has to pay a million dollars in security. Yes. What, so, what are you supposed to do? Er Erwin and I started teaching together. We had offices right next door to each other at DePaul in, in Chicago a long wow. time ago. So we've been a long time friends. I recently talked to him about it because I said, no, now you're going to have fun. Now you're going to Berkeley. Yeah. <laughs> in, 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 <laughs> Absolutely. I, I got asked to advise the task force to deal with the Charlottesville events in Virginia. I was asked by the governor of Virginia to do that. Yeah. And the question that Erwin posed was one of the questions that they're debating now in Virginia. Can you impose the security costs on those who are going to threaten the violence? And this is, you know, as a lawyer, what you do is you go along, you think you know stuff, and then you realize there's a whole bunch of cases on things you never had heard of before. Mm -hmm. There's actually quite a bit of, of law hmm. that says you can impose the reasonable costs of security on the groups that want to use it. It's, I'm not sure that's right or wrong, but you mm. can. I, I don't think that that's a cogent argument in terms of Berkeley. And I don't think you can impose too many costs in terms of the public realm. And here, here's my theory. We've embraced the idea that our public spaces are dedicated to free speech. It's so part of the overhead of society is to pay for the police, to pay for the security that it takes to make a rally safe. We subsidize free speech in our open spaces. And yeah, maybe you can charge a little bit to use the Boston Common or something like that for a rally. But if you char start charging too much, the very charging of it is, is um, not carrying out the societal responsibility to allow this discourse. And I'd say the same of a university. 
I know we have the chief financial officer of the university here in the audience, and he may not want to hear this, but I think to some degree, if you know there's going to be a big event on the campus and you've got to have police do overtime, you've got to make it, that's part of your overhead for run, being part of the free speech enterprise, I would say, part of what it means to be a university. And you've got to try to figure out a way to absorb some of that cost. Um, so I think I'm disagreeing a bit with Erwin. If what he's saying is, oh, there's a million dollar price tag, we get to stop it. I'm, uh, I'm not sure he even believes that. Fascinating. Uh, well, Julie, you, 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 uh, you, nod, you sort of right. nodded sympathetically at the yeah. idea of don't make me pay a million dollars. But I think that I agree with Rod um, because I think what I think about in these situations is take us back several decades and we would be saying, well, we can't have debates on campus about civil rights or take us back not very long ago, and we would be saying we can't have debates on campus about marriage equality because somebody's offended, because there's gonna be a protest, because we have to have extra security. So when we start applying costs uh, to, for people to, to uh, share their views, in many ways we can set back our society or, or, or uh, get in the way of of progress, so I think we have to be very careful of how we, it's another way of limiting speech in a sense, um, but it's a very real problem for campuses. These costs are extreme. Uh, Berkeley spent, what, $600,000 on one, 800,000 on another recently. Um, fortunately, we're not Berkeley, so <laughs> we probably won't um, have that. Um, issue, but uh, uh, it's, it's a very, very real issue, but it is part of being a university. And the university is fundamentally a marketplace of ideas. And we are trying to advance knowledge and bring together different perspectives. So um, I fear that if we had a uh, policy nationally that, you know, that said in higher education that said if you're bringing a perspective that people don't like you have to pay all the costs that we really are limiting speech. That is a powerful and eloquent and important defense of the purpose of a university. Did you hear what your president just said? The purpose of a university is to foster the marketplace of ideas. There's a wonderful new book by Keith Whittington uh, called Speaking Freely, which agrees with you, uh, uh, Julie, and says the central purpose of, you, of a university is the production and dissemination of knowledge. And any policies that uh, thwart that central purpose uh, uh, are uh, not acceptable. Uh, so these are deep philosophical questions, and they are practical questions. And hearing both of you grapple with them so thoughtfully is inspiring. We have two questions from the audience, and I'm gonna ask them now. Helping these tough conversations helps push our society to, became, to, come up, to become better, so how do we encourage more people to get involved in having these conversations? What a great question, uh, President Wolman. Well, I hope that Widener is creating a model for other universities, and that we're, because my feeling is, the biggest problem is being afraid of having these conversations. The fear is not good, it shuts down conversation. So if we can create a model for other universities, I think we begin to build a society where we can have these conversations, where we understand that the best way to answer offensive speech is with more speech rather than with violence or with I refuse to listen to you, um, or the heckler's veto, which is, which is unacceptable. Um, so I think we, we, are, we have a model that we're trying to put forth that changes the way we interact with, with each other and think about these issues. Um, Rod, I'll ask your advice, and I'll just say I'm, I'm asking also because, because the Constitution Center is trying to create these conversations on all platforms, online, around the country, and debates. We're eager to collaborate with you and use this model, but what, what are models that you have found to be Well, one option available? would be, if you're interested in this, to enroll in the Widener Commonwealth Law School or the Delaware Law School. We have these conversations all the time. <laughs> yes, good place to good start. Good job, good Excellent. job. Excellent, very good. If, I, you, if I think, one isn't able to have that remarkable privilege, what else I, can you do? <laughs> I, I, I think James Madison, for all the culture shock, would be 
impressed that um, this center is here, that people like you are doing this work, that you can go to Barnes and Noble or the gift shop here and get the Federalist Papers, that a dude like me would be carrying the Constitution in my pocket. <laughs> Wait, wait, you got the wrong one. All right, there you I'll go. You. I'll sign yours. You sign mine. You can have this. It's the Constitution Center one. Oh, I love that. Thank, Thank you. you. Sure. And you can't it's have got, too many. And it's well worn, so Absolutely. you obviously refer back to it. I do. There we go. I think you're doing the kind of work that has to be done, and I, and I think the idea of um, creating forums like this and looking for ways to push it out through social media and other things like that are the way to do it. I'll make a plug now for the central educational platform that we have that I want you all to learn from and download that I've shown to Julie and Rod. It's called the Interactive Constitution. It's an app in the App Store. I want you to download it, not now because we're talking, but <laughs> after the show. And it brings together the leading liberal and conservative scholars in America to write about every clause of the Constitution, describing what they agree about and what they disagree about. So you can take a nice uncontroversial provision like the Second Amendment, and you find the leading liberal and conservative scholars nominated by these two lawyers groups with a thousand words about what they agree the Second Amendment means, and then separate thousand word statements about what they disagree about. Isn't that an inspiring modeling of the very civil dialogue that we're having here? And you multiply that by all 80 clauses of the Constitution, from the Export and Port Preference Clause to the Commerce Clause to the Foreign Emoluments Clause. And Rod and I teach this stuff. I, you probably know all 80 of them. I, I you know, just are familiar. I didn't even know the word. Them. I know. <laughs> it's, it's a constitutional feast. And if you download this and just pick a clause a day or a week and read the common statement and read the separate statements, you will educate yourself and inspire yourself to learn more. So it's a really great platform. Um, here's a great uh, question, which is going to test my constitutional reading glasses. But, but here it is. Uh, common ground will never be reached without addressing the elephant in the room. Fear of the other is key, but the level of fear is escalated when some have to deny resources to those viewed as less than them. Who will be brave enough to forge forward? Clergy, police, politicians, teachers, professors, all gatekeepers must enter with a renewed vision. Julie. One of the things, that's a great question, yeah. and I'm, I wish I could answer it. <laughs> in a way that really did justice to it. I'm not sure that I can. Um, one of the things that I think is very special about a university setting is that we get to know each other as scholars, as learners, as people in clubs or on sports teams before we get to know each other's politics. So we appreciate each other. Professors will understand this. All of us who have taught will understand this. We have a class. We have a great student in that class. They come to class prepared every time. They participate. They engage. They stay after and talk with us about something that we talked about. Um, they get sick and they write us a really nice email message apologizing that they missed a class and asking if they can turn in that work you know, immediately. Um, and then they show up in a t-shirt promoting a candidate who we find offensive. It's hard to not be open. It's, it's hard to, to, to shut that person out, to say, I'm not going to listen to you. I don't like you. Um, you're a person that I would never talk to. You're a person who I find offensive, because we already like them. So we have these, this is why universities are a very special setting where we come together in a way that focuses on learning and growing and getting to know people. And I think because of that, it gives us the opportunity to do exactly what that question is suggesting, which is to appreciate other people for what they bring and to see that everyone deserves support and an opportunity to learn and grow. We're also all about access to education. So one of the one piece of that's a very long question. It was both sides of the index card. <laughs> um, but um, it, it, it's um, in part the question is about access and giving people the resources they need to participate in our society. And that's a that's a very important 
aspect of what we do as universities and what we, what we do as educators and what we do at Widener in terms of our civic engagement is really creating resources and access to learning. Um, I believe, it, it's not gonna surprise you, that education is key in all of this. Mm -hmm. That education is the fundamental way to address this search for common ground, but also to address the search for equality and resources that are distributed in a more equitable way in our society. That is an inspiring charge. Uh, we need to end in a moment. So Rod, I think I'm gonna give you the, the closing statement, the last word if I may, but, but President Woolman just has created this amazing initiative, which I have to say is a model for the nation. And ladies and gentlemen, students of Widener, you are fortunate to be at this university with this remarkable president and uh, this First Amendment scholar, this search for common ground is not some kind of abstract, mushy uh, desire for peace. This is central to the future of democracy and what the conversations you are modeling can be models to the nation for how uh, they too can see common ground. But Rod, uh, Julie just said, you know, civic education is cr crucial to the future of democracy. The founders believe that, Madison and Jefferson said it, why? Tell us concretely why they believed that democracy would atrophy without an educated citizenry, and why is it so important that these students have these conversations? Well, you've just heard Julie's eloquent statement, and I thought the question was not really a question, an eloquent statement. <laughs> Let's talk about what the framers thought in terms of the idea of progress and how they, I think, embodied the, the American hope and the human hope that education ultimately leaves us better than the press past generation um, had us. When Madison wrote the Bill of Rights, when the Great Compromise was done right here in Independence Hall, that Constitution embraced slavery. And then there was a Civil War and the Emancipation Proclamation and slavery ended. And then the passage of the 13th Amendment and the 14th Amendment. But those amendments were gutted by Plessy versus Ferguson and the civil rights cases and other 19th century interpretations. But that was overruled by Brown versus the Board of Education. Yet Brown versus the Board of Education did not bring equality. It took Martin Luther King and the struggles of the civil rights movement. But then there was the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And we still have racial turmoil. We still have events like Charlottesville. But think of Charlottesville on the other side of the coin. Yes, a woman was killed murdered there, yes, we saw evil, violent speech, but the nation rallied around the good. At every, at every state and federal level, officials, whatever you may think of President Trump, whatever you may think of his response, at least he did respond. And many others responded eloquently, and there was universal condemnation of the racism. So there is this notion that we go by fits and starts, but there is, there is progress. And I think the hope of that progress is the idea of rational discourse, the kind of common ground, respect for others, the willingness to listen to others, and also the idea that as students, you're not just here to debate, it's not just an intellectual enterprise. You're here to have lives of meaning and consequence, to go out and do something and whatever your calling is gonna be that makes the world a better place. And that's my hope for the, you. And thank you so much for hosting us. It's been a wonderful event. Thank you. Wow. Wonderful. Beautiful last words of this conversation is not gonna end here. Your conversations will continue this morning. If you look on your programs, ladies and gentlemen, you'll see a number which corresponds to a table just outside the auditorium. Any attorneys who are with us today, first of all, my condolences, and second, <laughs> please stay in this room and continue the conversation with Dean Smaller, which is a treat. And for the next 30 minutes or so, you'll help us discuss and process what we've just heard and seek common ground. And, uh, uh, President Woolman, let us make this remarkable convening the beginning of an ongoing collaboration with the Constitution Center. Thank you for modeling civil discourse, and ladies and gentlemen, have a great discussion. Thank you so much.